This is Lesson 111, VHDL Example 76. In this example, we'll write a VHDL program for a mouse interface using the PS2 port. The mouse has four modes. The one we're going to be interested in is the stream mode. This is the default mode that transmits three data packets to the host. However, to get it to start transmitting, the host must first transmit a hex F4 to the mouse. Here are the three uh, data bytes that will get sent. Remember the PS2 actually sends out 11-bit packets and within there there is an 8-bit byte, in this case Y7 down to Y0 and X7 down to X0. These correspond to the Y and the X velocity of the mouse. So if you move the mouse back and forth in the horizontal direction you'll get an X velocity measured and if you move it up and down you'll get a Y velocity measured. They can be signed numbers depending on which direction you're moving and the direction you're moving is determined by these two sign bits which will end up in shift 3. So if you take YS and prepend it to Y7 there and you take X uh, S and prepend it to the 8 bits of X, you end up getting a 9 bit signed number for each velocity. So this corresponds to data values between minus 256 and plus 255. If you move too fast, then you'll get an overflow bit set there in this shift 3 uh, data packet. Uh, these are the overflow bits for Y and the overflow bits for X. These two bits, R and L, will tell you which uh, button you're pressing. If you're pressing the right button, this R bit will go to 1. If you're pressing the left button, uh, this L button will go to 1. Now, as we saw when we looked at how to interface a PS2 port, if you want to send data out the PS2 port, or send the clock out, you need a tri-state buffer. And here's how we'll implement the tri-state buffer. We're going to need this because remember we have to send this F4 uh, byte to the mouse. So to implement a tri-state buffer, we'll define this signal, say PS2 CIO here, and we'll set that equal to the PS2 CIN when this enable is signal is equal to 1 on the tri-state buffer. So if this is 1, then this output is equal to this input. Else, we want it to be a high impedance, so we set it equal to Z. Remember, Z is one of our standard logic uh, values, meaning high impedance. And we do the same for the data line. Define PS2DIO to get PS2DN when the D enable signal is 1, else it gets Z, the high impedance. And then the pin numbers associated with the PS2 port that we've labeled PS2C and PS2D, we just set to this signal PS2CIO. Okay, recall this host device communication protocol. We had this back in Lesson 109. And you remember the data is sent from the host to, uh, to the device by reading on the rising edge of the clock. So the way this works, if the host wants to send a byte, this data byte, it first brings the clock line low, it has to hold it low for 100 microseconds, then it brings data line low, and then it's going to release the clock. Remember it does that by the C enable signal, and then it's going to enable this, its data line so it can send the data but now the clock comes from the device. So this tells the device to send these 11 clock signals, in which case the data is sent from the host and the device reads them on the rising edge of the clock. Then after the device reads the 11 bytes, it brings the data line low. So the host has to turn the data line around by making the data enable zero and then the device will acknowledge it by bringing data line low and then it brings both data and clock back high. Now, 
Here's the state diagram for the mouse controller. Again, it looks a little complicated, and it's a little more complicated than the keyboard because we have to send data to the mouse as well as receive data from the mouse. So let's go through it in pieces. Looking at the top row here, we start in the start state, and it brings the clock low for 100 microseconds. So we're going to wait in this state for 100 microseconds, and then we're going to make data go low. So it brings the data line low in this state, and then it needs to release the clock. So it's going to release the clock by bringing the uh, C enable signal to zero because now the device has to start sending out the clock signals. And so here, this is the C enable signal. So it first sets CN to one here, and then when it brings the clock low, this state, and then it releases it by bringing this C enabled uh, back to zero. So for the rest of the time, the clock is going to come from the mouse. In this send byte state, this is the state, we're going to stay in this state to send the entire byte F4 to the mouse. We'll have a separate process to do that. And that uh, data is going to go out PS2DN, so we have to make sure that D enable is 1 while we're sending this byte out. Once we send the byte out, we go to this wait acknowledge state because now the device has to acknowledge it, so we're going to wait for this data line to go low. Here's the data line go low. That's the acknowledge byte. Then we're going to wait for the uh, clock line to go low. So we're going to wait for this clock to go low. That's in this state. And then we go to this state and we're going to wait to, for, to release both the clock and the data line. That is, we're going to wait for both clock and data to go high. And once we do that, we'll go to the next state. And in this state, the device will actually echo back the F4 that we sent. So the mouse acknowledges by transmitting the F4 back to the host, and that's what these two states do. This is very similar to what we had in the keyboard one. It's going to produce this clock. We're going to go around here. Uh, it looks like 11 times. Turns out it's a little bit of a trick. We actually have to do it 12 times because we use an extra clock cycle because we had to turn the bus around from being having the data sent from the host to the mouse. And now we have to send it from the mouse to the host. So we actually go around 12 times here, and it will end up sending this uh, F4 back to the uh, host. Once we do that, we'll get that F4 acknowledge, and then we go into this state, these two states, weight clock low, weight clock high, and each of these uh, shift uh, datas are 11 bits wide, you see. So we got three of them. So actually we're going to go around here 33 times, sending all three of these. And we're going to take the first one, which is really this one, and they get shifted through. So after 33 of these clock pulses, we will have received these three bytes of data, and we will have loaded them into shift 1, shift 2, and shift 3. This one will contain the y velocity, this the x velocity, and this the data with the sign bits and the button pressings. When we do that, we'll go over to get m data, in which we'll collect the y velocity, that's going to be shift 1, 8 down to 1. We'll collect the x velocity, that's going to be uh, x7 down to x1 from shift 2, and then we'll have a, a little byte 3 uh, variable that, in which we'll put this data for the sign bits and the, um, and the push button switches. And then we'll go back to here and collect it again, and this will go on forever. As you move the mouse, you'll continually get these three uh, bytes sent in. Well, this is the VHDL code. We won't go through it in detail, but let me point out the important part. The PS2C and PS2D are bidirectional, so we must declare them to be in-out here. 
Most of the time we have they're either in or out. These are in out because we turn them around. We have our usual states that we have defined in the usual way. Uh, we have the uh, we have some signals for the mouse velocity and we're also going to compute the mouse data. Now the mouse data is just going to be the basically the integral of the velocity to get the position and so we do that by adding up uh, the velocity. So if we keep a running count of the addition of each velocity that will be equal to the position and as the velocity goes negative then you know, the position moves back down again. We have our three shifts. Uh, F4 command is where we're going to put the F4 in. These are our bit counts. Uh, here's our tri-state buffer that we went over before. Here's the filter, same filter that we use for the keyboard. And then here's the state machine. Uh, this is the usual uh, initialization when you push the clear button. And then this is the big case statements. Um, everything in here you can just follow through by comparing it to the uh, to the state machine. Here's how we release the clock by setting C enable to zero. Now in the send byte, we set the send flag to one before we enter this state, and then we count. There's a bit count that we're keeping track of. And we'll see the process, separate process in a minute that will actually send this byte. And when we get done, we'll set the send flag back to zero. And then we go to the wait acknowledge and the wait for clock low state. And then we wait to release both the clock and the data. And then we go to the wait clock low, wait clock high. We go around here, remember, 12 times in order to get the acknowledge byte FA back. And we collect it, we get the velocity, make the shift data in the get acknowledge, and then we go to this wait clock low, and here we're going to go 33 times. This bit count 3 is going to be 33, so we're going to go between here and the wait clock high 33 times, and when we do, we will get the x velocity data out and we'll put it in X mouse V and byte 3 is going to contain the data for the uh, sign bits and the overflow bits and the push button bits. Then when we go to get M data after every 33 times we'll compute this distance. Uh, so this is the position data we just take a running count. So we start with this at zero and then we just keep adding each time uh, the velocity data. And so the next time around we'll add it to the running count of the distance. So X mouse D and Y mouse D will contain the X Y positions. X mouse V and Y mouse V will contain the velocity data. The uh, Here's the process by the way that sends the uh, F4, we set it equal to F4 here. Here's the F4. We have to start with a stop bit and parity bit because we're sending at least significant bit first, you see. We actually send out 10 bits here. So that's how we send out that uh, F4 in the send byte uh, in the send byte command. Here is a out, uh, out select. There's a process that has the X mouse, Y mouse velocity, X mouse, Y mouse distance, and the select line. So if the select line is zero, the output is going to be X data and Y data. This is the output from this controller, and it will contain either the velocity data or the distance data, depending on the value of select, which will be an input you can set to whichever you want. So if you want to get distance data, you set select to one. If you want to get velocity data, you set it equal to zero. So here's a top level design you can use to test this mouse controller. Here's the PS2C and PS2D in outs. And we have the usual M clock buttons, LEDs, and the seven segment display outputs. And we will set X mouse, which is a 16 bit data, 
that we're going to display is going to be the x data 7 down to 0 concatenated with the y data. We'll display these on the 7 segment display. So the first two digits will contain the x data and the right two digits will contain the y data. And then on LEDs 2 and 3 we will put the uh, right and left buttons. So if you push those and then the sign bits which is x data uh, these are the most significant bits of the 9-bit sign data. We'll put in LD0 and 1. And then we'll just port map it, the clock div. So when the mouse control will connect the select input to button 0. So if you're not pushing button 0, you'll see the velocity data on the 7-segment displays. And if you push button 0, then it will show you the distance measurements on the seven segment displays. So this is the mouse controller. In the book there's another example of using this mouse controller to move the sprite initials that we had back in lesson 106. And you could use this mouse controller to move any sprite on the BGA screen, uh, including the one you had for the block ROM. So if you made a little picture of yourself, you could move it around on the screen using this mouse. So this concludes the lessons for this book. Good luck in writing your VHDL programs.